Good evening and welcome to the Greg Thompson Sports Show. You are joining us here this week with our special guest, Nick Corti from, you guys know him from Over the Cap and all his contributions there, as well as, uh, as his Twitter handle says, being the compensatory picks guy, uh, he's someone that I, I've gone to as a source as we've kind of gotten more and more into this over the years uh, and learning more about it. Nick, how we doing? Doing well. How are you doing? Good, good. It's uh, it's interesting. I know, you know, I apologize on behalf of Bill's Mafia. I think you got the brunt of a lot of the frustration this year because people saw you as the the go to resource for how the offset works and all the different um parts of the equation of the compensatory pick formula. And everybody was kind of counting on a third round pick this year. So before we get into explaining what happened there. How did you become that person? How did you get into this this niche? How did you carve out this space as uh, being the compensatory pick guy? Okay, so I mean, many years ago, I mean, this was like around turn of the century. There, uh, there was a guy by, who went by the name Adam JT thirteen who would uh, project that on his own and did a really good job with that, you know. And I learned the rules about how all that worked. Um, yeah, then he stopped doing it around the time when I started getting to work on over the cap. And I realized that once we had, you know, all this contract data, you know, I could not only just do my own projection, but also just get it updated in real time as teams made signings in free agency to kind of bring a look even more awareness and excitement to it. So I think I've been doing that since the uh, 2015 NFL draft, I think. So that'd be 10 years of projections. So it's just something that I kind of fell into and uh, fi figured out that I could be good at it. And, um, you know, I've, like I said, like you said, I've carved off, carved off that niche to kind of uh, just help share more information to the NFL world. No, oh, that's awesome. Man. It's obviously one of our goals at Cover One is taking those complex parts of football and the game that everybody loves and make it a little more digestible for people. So I know, you know, in recent years, your hit ratio had been incredibly high. There was a couple different things. I think last year there was maybe somebody with the cutoff between a third and a fourth. And then this year, the big one was less apparent to everyone you know obviously there have been people who have followed in your footsteps and dove into it even more and more and kind of understood the different areas and both the 49ers with jimmy garoppolo and, and the bills um with tremaine edmonds and, and their signings it, it didn't seem to be debatable it didn't seem to be you know anywhere close to the line they seem to be like pretty clear definitions based on the previous equation we saw not as much vocally from the 49ers and John Lynch, but Brandon Bean in his press conference uh, shared that he reached out to the 49ers and together they reached out to the NFL basically saying, hey, what the hell? You confirmed to us multiple times during the season that we were projected to get a third round pick. What changed here? And then there was a, another bit of a kind of a dark period here with no information. And now a little bit more has come out on what changed and why it happened. Now, whether we agree is debatable, but maybe try to talk through a little bit what that process was like in having the projection, seeing the difference in an area that was not very clear or transparent, and then piecing together what happened after that presser and now the new information that's come out. Yeah, so just to start, uh, teams get a, a third round compensatory pick if they have a player uh, that left in free agency that was not canceled off by another signing. If that player ranks in the top 5% of league wide players according to the compensatory formula. And I mean, throughout the entire process, um, all, both Edmonds of the Bills and also. Um, Garoppolo and McGlinchey of the 49ers, but they also signed Hargrave, who the Eagles got a third round pick for as well. Uh, they were all comfortably third rounders, as, as I could see in my uh, progress, in my uh, um, projection. And, you know, in, in hindsight, it seems like that's the way Buffalo and San Francisco thought about it too. So, you know, when that release came out and I, and I saw that, it was just like, this just doesn't make sense. I can't make this work within. I mean, sometimes, you know, you mentioned those cutoffs when it's just off by just a few rankings, you know, that's one thing, you know, it's tough to estimate what the 
entire league wide number of players that's considered. But this just made no sense. And I said as much right on Twitter immediately on that. Um, and also potentially implicated the Bengals and their fans got really happy with me when there was a correction that, that upgraded a pick of theirs to the third round, but still left the bills and 49ers with a fourth. And so I was like, okay, this still doesn't make sense. So when Brandon Bean had that press conference, those were a few early clues trying to figure out, you know, how on earth, the NFL Management Council came to this calculation. And so that was a first step, tried a couple things that got better, still didn't work. And then finally, we got some information that said that with restructured contracts, they the NFL MC judges those as completely new and shorter contracts. And in the article I wrote that finally figured this out, I, I used an example of, this, of the player that I think Bean was referring to as one of these absurd cases and just demonstrated in the numbers just how absurd that was. And But the good news, at least, is I once think I, I have put, that example yeah, here, you right showed there, the restructure there. where there's a, an enormous non-prorated salary of 18, 18 million coming up in one year that's clearly not the average that you would you know find for the total number and that all of a sudden in this scenario they would count this as a 28 million dollar player well they counted it as a two-year contract instead of a oh. five which i mean that's just good. doesn't make any sense uh that's not how anyone would typically view an nfl contract but the, i mean the good news at least for my projections was once i made this adjustment for the players that had all these restructures, it lined up everything perfectly. Um, okay. and so at least it cleaned up the calculation and how to do the projections going forward, even if it didn't make Bills fans or 49ers fans right, happy. Right. Le learning it, how it, didn't change the fact that they still felt like they're going to short end of the yeah. state. And it was confirmed that, you know, Bean was correct that in saying like, like this much, I think, I think he said with how them and the 49ers missed and, uh, and I agree. I agree with him that that they got a raw deal, but it is what it is. And at least now I know how to proceed moving moving forward. Yeah, and you know, it, it's not perfect in the in the way that they do that. There's always that bit of wiggle room that's there. Um, before we get into pivoting to looking at this coming year and where they're at, because the Bills do have the potential of anywhere from three to zero. Like all of those things are in play. I think the zero is probably pretty unlikely it's pretty likely they'll get at least one but they could get a second or a third and which round those picks come from can change um for maybe fans who aren't as familiar with it give the the elevator pitch of how the compensatory pick formula works on what net gained means and what the qualifying contracts are Right. So it all starts with how many players that qualify as compensatory free agents leave versus signed. So if you if you don't have a net loss of CFAs, you have to have more leave than come in. If you don't have that, you're not going to get comp picks. Um, after that, uh, the rounds are valued primarily on average per year on APY uh, with an adjustment made for snap counts on offense, on defense, and an even smaller one made on uh, postseason honors, which is only uh, AP All Pro and uh, Pro Football Writers Association awards. So, um, but the APY is the dominant one there. Now there are, as we discovered la last uh, draft with the Bills and 49ers, how that how that's calculated is has a few little tweaks to it. Um, but uh, that's probably the pitch in a nutshell there without getting into too many of the uh, more uh, wonkier details. So, and just to, to help people explain, I know a lot of fans, as soon as they see one of their players sign elsewhere, they're immediately go, oh, good, we'll get a comp pick for that. And I know even, unfortunately, some national 
uh, reporters don't help with that as well. You, you see some people, their immediate response is, oh, well, they lost that guy, but don't worry, they'll get a, a compensatory pick for it. And it just simply doesn't work that way. You get you use the example of the Jets. Uh, Bryce Huff signed an enormous contract, a $17 million contract with the Eagles. And everyone's thinking, well, we didn't sign anyone big, so that shouldn't hurt us. But they signed the amount of players that it offset anything they would have got back. So even though none of them were that big of signings, I guess Tyron Smith was short term, but but kind of big, but nowhere near 17 million. They still they gained four, they lost four. That cancels out. You don't get any compensatory pick formula. So for everybody listening, that's what what Nick and I are trying to to help explain a little bit because we're about to go into the bills and we're going to go through. Uh, Nick actually built a really nice uh, kind of visual of the different scenarios of what can happen for the bills this year in where they could get or lose some compensatory pick formula, uh, some compensatory picks this year as it comes up. So one last thing is I pull this up on screen here so we can show all of our different scenarios. Um, help the fans. What is a CFA? A CFA is a compensatory free agent, and that player has to be first an unrestricted free agent. He has to have had four or more accrued seasons, uh, and his contract must have expired. Players who are cut do not factor in. Uh, let's to this let's point. Uh, take a quick aside there. You you highlighted that word because previously a lot of people had assumed that any contract that voided was not compensatory pick eligible. But now there's been a clarification or uh, more education out there that if it expires or um, if the void happens based on a set date or timing mechanism, that that is an expiring contract and if it's more like a player option or team option kind of void i don't know if i'm explaining that part well uh that that is not compensatory pick formula but that expiring void years do count towards it now or we yeah. learned that they do now yeah the best way to keep voids in mind is look if it if they shorten the original length of the contract if they oh, okay. if the contract okay. is shortened then it is not eligible uh to that player is not eligible to become a compensatory free agent like Most Stephon board, Diggs just happened with the the Texans they yep, he originally great, had years on it they shrank it down that he becomes a free agent sooner with the void years letting that that contract void out that means that they would now not be comp pick eligible if, if he were to sign somewhere else in 2025 yep that's correct a great example but most void years um, are just done for um, salary cap yeah, accounting, um, and uh, they 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 almost they, it's rare that it actually shortens the contract. Like with Diggs, that was more of a negotiation with the Texans to you know you know agree to let him become a free agent at a at a short per shorter period of time in exchange for whatever the Texans wanted. Yeah. So. Um, so real quick, I'm going to share just so uh, fans who are watching can see uh, one of my favorite. Now it's so funny on my phone when I go to search for compensatory pick formula. Now uh, Google says like you visit here often and that thing comes up on, on over the cap when I pull it up. I was like, thank you, Google. I, I'm aware that I, I come here often, but thank you for reinforcing <laughs> that for me. Um so I'm going to share, and I'll put this in the show link for anybody who's looking. Uh, a lot of what Nick's going to go through, and a lot of what I use here is on OverTheCap.com. It's my favorite site for any salary cap elements and, and anything that's out there. And you'll see here um, what we're going to go through are the different scenarios that come into play with the players who are gained and lost. So there's actually an interesting element in some of the numbers that are involved because the Bills this year more than other years. I don't know that they never have, but the Bills have a lot more like borderline players than I ever remember in the past. It's really interesting to see how it came together. So very clearly um, players who are going to remain in the equation, Gabe Davis and Leonard Floyd, their calculation APY of 13 million and 10 million. Those are going to stay in any version of this. The same thing they're signing to Curtis Samuel is going to stay in the equation no matter what. I think Dane Jackson and Terrell Dodson are, 99.9%. .9%. They're both at 4.25 million, 4.26 million. Their rankings in the equation here is very, very likely to stay part of it. Then you start to get down into Austin Johnson, who we signed at 3.5 million. I'd say he's more likely than not 
And then you get into Tim Seto at 3 million, Mike Edwards at 2.8, even Mac Collins at 2.6. Nick's going to walk us through the different scenarios of where those players may or may not end up within the compensatory pick formula uh, to be able to qualify. And that's what we're going to go through here today to show the potential outcomes that could happen as the season plays out with what he laid out, um, not only what their compensation is, but with their playing time, if they were to win awards, some of the other factors. Um, so Nick, when you show the APYs that are here, how are those fluid based on incentives that could be achieved? Or is that pretty well set uh, ahead of time on what the actual financial element is? Yeah, starting with the 2020 CBA, they are a little fluid. Um, incentives will count under one of two conditions. One is if they are likely to be earned. That's a designation that that the NFL places based Which on. Which for anybody, that's yeah. Did they achieve it last year? Did they hit exactly. that statistical exactly. element last year or not? Yeah, and, and I try my best to add all the LTBEs in as I find them during this time of year. Obviously, some, some of them are more difficult to track down. Um, so, But the ones I know of should already be in the formula. And then, of course, they also uh, are factored in if the player earns them, which we won't know the answer till until usually at or near the end of the regular season. Yeah, and some of those I know the most common one the the Bills just very recently signed Marquez Valdez Scantling. He had three sets of um, incentives that were three tiers of catches, three tiers of yards, three th tiers of touchdowns. All of them were starting just above what he did last year. So the initial calculation, none of, not that he's part of this, but just as fans are familiar with those incentives, all of those are not likely to be earned. They won't hit the Bills cap this year. If he achieves those, they'll be factored in. It would count towards the Bills cap in 2025. And if he were a CFA, if he were if he were signed prior to the date, that's another cutoff of the calculation here. Um, I don't know if it's always like the Monday after the draft or a set date in the calendar, but it's always that week after the draft right. of anyone signed after Since that the point. 2020 CBA, it has been the Monday after the draft. Okay. So, uh, and obviously, Valdez Scantling was signed later than the Monday after the draft. So he's not eligible, but just as an example, he would be one where the initial calculation would have him as not qualifying. But in theory, if he hits all of his incentives and this year, I think for him, it would be like 45 catches for 750 yards and seven touchdowns. He would go to 4.5 million, which in theory would put him into the equation. So not that that's very likely that somebody hits every single not likely to be an incentive, but in theory, there are guys who are below or even well below the threshold who could leapfrog into the equation and shuffle around the order from other players. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I didn't hear what his uh, base uh, APY was, but I, I'm guessing it was pretty low. Yeah. Uh, 2.5 in cash. I think they gave him the 1.125 uh, minimum salary, 1.125 also in signing bonus. They use void years to kick that out. Um, so I guess in the new calculation, I'm not sure. Maybe that's not 2.5. Maybe that's the 1.475. Yeah, no, that, 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 should, no, that should be that should be 2.5. It's it's yeah, really only what I restructures after the fact. But yeah, 2.5 would be right on that bubble of qualification that we're yeah. going to talk about soon enough with uh, some of these other players uh, involving the Bills. Um, but you're absolutely correct that if if he were to hit those incentives, his, his APY would be. Uh, judge tire and that is a very even if you're not a cfa you know it's the league-wide players matter in the calculation so oh, if someone like valda scantly moves up that might shut move other players down and that and might with the scenarios we're talking about with how close especially the two that interest me are like the tim settle and austin johnson i think it seems very likely that mike edwards will get bumped below i even think it's pretty likely tim settle will but I, you know, in theory, you could even get to where Austin Johnson comes into wiggle room. And th I didn't realize that the players who weren't compensatory eligible, every player's compensation goes into the ranking and, and equation, which could bump those guys down. So the the Justin Simmons of the world who haven't signed yet, the Yannick Ngakwe's of the world mm -hmm. who haven't signed yet, um, those guys, although they're not comp pick eligible, they do go into the ranking and could, if you have guys who are only one or two or three spots away from a cutoff, 
that could bump them down below where that threshold is. That That's interesting information. Right. And I mean, one player alone almost certainly won't make the difference. But if you combine a lot of those players together collectively, that's where, you know, things can change. Okay. So walk us through a little bit here on the different scenarios that you had built out here. You have one up at the top left. There's some some check boxes of whether those players remain as part of the equation. And then we have here, which comp pick the bills receive and I'll kind of highlight which bucket we're going after here. Uh, it seems like in seven out of the eight scenarios, the bills get a fourth round pick for Gabe Davis. That seems very, very likely in most scenarios. Um, so I, mm -hmm. I almost want to start with scenario five <laughs> and explain the one where <laughs> they don't, but go ahead. Let's start at scenario one and we'll walk our way through. Yeah, um, I'm going to actually start at scenario two because okay. that's the one that's currently projected right now. Yeah, and... so if anybody goes to overthecap.com, that's what they would see in there right now is both Gabe Davis and Leonard Floyd counting towards it as of right now. Yeah, and um, the snap count estimates on this, I use a average over the past four seasons. Um that's not perfect, but it's about the most accurate that I can come up with. Because, I mean, if I were just to do last year, I mean, some players are on injured reserve all the time and they don't get any count, even if they like played all the snaps most of the time. I mean, there's always going to be some sort of variance that I, I don't have a crystal ball to, to project. But, um, yeah, the snaps for Edwards up the... I wish I had those up. I, I wish I had the estimates from uh, last year up that I have on right there. Um, but, you know, Edwards obviously played a lot of snaps on defense with the Chiefs last year, whereas Hollins, I'm not sure. I'm not even sure who he played with last year. I'm not sure if he was more on special teams or if he just didn't get many snaps on offense. Um, yeah, when you said the four-year average, that that piqued my interest because that does grab Mac Howland's really big season two years ago in Las Vegas where he played a ton and was arguably their number one wide receiver. And then last year in Atlanta, he did play and was in 13 games, um, but less so as a receiver, much more so specifically as – a uh, special teams player so certainly something that that factors into to that yeah, overall uh, count. yeah i'm looking at it now and it, sh it should be uh it should be uh, made clear that special team snaps do not count in the compensatory formula interesting uh, ex okay. except, at all. except for good. except for kickers and punters but it's but they don't have snap they don't use snap counts it's a different uh calculation altogether that that i, I won't get into right now so yeah, so Hollins, obviously the year two years ago where he played over a thousand snaps uh, makes a big difference for him, whereas just about every other season of his career is, you know, 286, 340, 345, 411 uh, as, yeah. you know, what most wide receiver four, wide receiver five guys play, which equates much more to what I expect this year with the Bills. Yeah. yeah and I think when it, when it comes to estimating these type of snaps you know on a you know a non-automated a non-automated way it's good to have a you know you know deep knowledge of the team itself and what what observers think the bill like what the bills plan to do you know with edwards and with hollands and you know that that's something where i always say you know you know someone who covers the bills like yourself probably knows that question better than others. Yeah, and so Mike Edwards is one looking at the last couple of years. It was 614. He had the one year with Tampa where he was truly a backup. Then 531, 814, 621 last year. A lot of those are 58%, 57%, 57%. With the signing of Taylor Rapp and the draft pick of Cole Bishop, I, I think that average is probably pretty healthy. I don't, I don't know that I see him coming in and playing – um, 94% like he did in Tampa in 2022. It, it's certainly in the realm of possibility. He could grab that starting spot and just hold it every single snap. I do think we'll see some rotation, some movement between the three. So I, I think that's another one where the average over the last four years is probably pretty healthy. Yeah, and that's that's a great observation here as I look at, uh, especially with the drafting of Bishop in the second round. I mean, you know, you, you hope that your rookie – you hope that your rookies can play right away, but realistically, most of them take 
some time to adjust. And that's where, you know, an Edwards might come in and, uh, you know, fill in those snaps if Bishop still needs a little bit more time. So in that scenario, in scenario two, we have Matt Cowens not being in the equation, being below the line. We have both Mike Edwards, obviously Austin Johnson, and Tim Settle um, being part of the equation uh, here, which you know Dane Jackson and Curtis Samuel cancel out, Terrell Dodson and Austin Johnson cancel out, Tim Settle and Mike Edwards cancel out. That leaves Gabe Davis and Leonard Floyd. One of the other players, obviously, that, that we talked about here was Tim Settle signing with the Texans. And I meant to look at that before uh, we started here on other editions. And I don't, there wasn't any other significant addition for um, the Texans. It was, you know, Farkasi and Settle. Um, so depending on where they played Danico Autry, I, who I see is a little more as a strong side kind of edge type guy, but um, it certainly seems like Tim Settle is going to play for them. I don't know if it's start. I don't know if it's more snaps than what he had last year, but it certainly seems like he's going to be part of their equation for it. So I, I do expect him to be there as maybe a, a probably similar to what he was with the bills last year. He played 379 snaps last year as kind of our number three defensive tackle. That kind of seems like the case here. With um, with Houston, there was no significant draft investment. They lost both their guys, so bringing in Fadakasi and now having Settle, that seems like their primary. And then with Danico Audrey, so having Settle third, I, I think that his four-year average is probably about right as well. That seems like a reasonable estimate short of an injury with Houston. Yeah, and I'm looking at Settle's career snaps. He's never played more than 35% of the snaps in any one season. And it should be noted that players only get a boost in snap counts if they play at least one quarter of the snaps on offense or defense. So, um, you know, we'll see how much settle plays, but that's where the injury factor comes in. You know, if he were to go down for the season week one, then he's not going to get any snap count boost in the formula. And that could really affect as to whether or not he makes the cut of qualifying as a compensatory free agent. Are there other thresholds? Are are they in like 25% increments as they go up? Is it like 25, 50, 75? Yeah. The way it works or? is you have to have at least 25%, um, and that will get you 25 points. Then anything above that is the same number of points as snaps rounded down to the nearest whole number. So if you had 74.5, okay, so you'd get 74 points. Okay. So if, based on his career, if he played 34% of the snaps for the Texans, he would get 34 points in the equation. That kind of correct. Stuff. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so now what would be the difference if we went from scenario two back to scenario one, where now all of a sudden Leonard Floyd is canceled out? Yeah, so I mean, this would be a scenario where both Edwards and Hollins get significant play time with the Bills. You know, we talked about Edwards's possible role with the team in 2024. What what do you think Hollins's role would be on the team as it stands right now? You know, they did draft Keon Coleman, I see. Yeah, so drafting Keon Coleman, they've obviously brought in a lot of similar type of guys like the Chase Claypool, Quintez Sivas, and obviously most recent signing to Marcus Velda Scantlin. Mm -hmm. I actually think all of those speak to Mac Hollins being more and more and more of a special teams maven, which obviously he's been a special teams captain on three different teams. That's where his value is, that mm -hmm. size. I do think that he's capable of playing receiver. We saw the production he had with Las Vegas two years ago. It is within his skill set. I think all the other moves tell me he's much more – wide receiver five ish and i i would say if i had to bet on whether he would hit above or below 25 percent of offensive snaps specifically um I, I think he would be just below that um and i think in much of his career he's been kind of borderline back and forth a lot of them right at 25 mm percent -hmm. of the the snap count um I think that he might trigger 25%. I'd be shocked if it went much above there. Between 25 and 30 yeah. would make sense. And if he came below 25, I would not be surprised. 
Yeah, I mean, so much of that, you know, will come down to injury, you know, yeah. you know, how, who, who gets hurt and when, you know, and also coach's decision, you know, what type of snaps does McDermott and his staff feel is appropriate for each receiver. Hollins is a really good blocking receiver. So you never know some of those things. Last year they used Gabe Davis almost as a second tight end in some run plays. Um, as far as body types, maybe Keon Coleman takes that, but I, I could see Mac Hollins mm-hmm. doing some of that um, in jumbo sets and large uh, running sets. So those are snap counts. On, that's a snap that would be played on offense, even if it's not a passing play. Um, I could see some of that come into play. Right now I would guess that he would fall below there um, and would yeah. – would not be in his favor in the in yeah, the- and and I think that's a good educated guess to make, you know, which is what we see in scenario two there, which is what's projected right now. And you know, it's always good to hear from those who follow the bills to you know know more of the details to get a feel for you know how accurate that projection will be. Okay. Um. Then we have basically scenario three is the same as scenario two, just swapping. This would be if Mac Hollins played a high snap count, but Mike Edwards didn't. Scenario two is Mike Edwards plays enough snaps to qualify. Mac Hollins doesn't. Um, Scenario four is the one that Bills fans will like the most. This would be basically if the rookies... Uh, play really well. So Keon Coleman plays a ton of snaps, makes it so we don't need Mac Hounds to be a run blocking receiver. He takes up those snaps plus all the receiving snaps we expect him to play. Uh, Cole Bishop is ready right off the bat, and maybe Cole Bishop and uh, Taylor Rapp are the starting safeties, and Mike Edwards is the third safety who comes in in um, just you know dime packages or, or different three safety looks. Uh, in that scenario, if Tim Settle remained uh, qualifying that's the one where you would still net out three comp picks with Gabe Davis as a fourth, Leonard Floyd as a fifth, and now Tim Settle as a seventh comes back into play. Yeah, and and I think you said it really well. If if scenario four happens, then I think very good things are happening for the Bills in general. And I feel I, like I, I feel like being in company will probably would probably see that seventh as just a you know, a, a nice to have. Correct. Um, Correct. But, you know, I, I think I, I would I would imagine that their priority is hoping to get that fourth and fifth. Yeah. And, and we've seen, obviously, with the moves that they've made, um, some of the other trades, they'll get the second for uh, Stefan Diggs. They also traded this year's fifth for Chicago's fourth next year. Um, so they already had two fourths there now being in a spot where you could have a third, fourth round pick. Um, they'd actually traded away the future fifth. So you could get it back here. So they could be in a spot where you have a first two seconds, a third and three fourths plus your fifth and, and, and later on picks. So being with, with that many early on would certainly give them a lot of, uh, ammo to move around. Um, so now the scary one, walk us through how would scenario five happen? Well, this is the one where, you know, now Edwards and Hollins are playing enough snaps to qualify for whatever reason, but also for whatever reason, Tim Settle falls likely below that 25% snap threshold that I talked about. He gets no bonus for snaps, and that leaves us in our unfortunate situation where the Bills have lost as many free agents as they've gained. Now, why is there still that net value seventh there? That would be because there's because the value of the players that were lost is significantly greater than the players that were gained. It's a pretty rare compensatory pick to be awarded because most teams are usually planning. You know, if they know they're having a big loss, they're going to try to plan against that. Or if they're if they're content with canceling out, they'll just go big and say, "Well, we'll." Let's go make a big signing of our own, and we think that'll be worth it. Um, yeah, I, I think this is. I think this is very unlikely, given what we've talked about with these three players, but certainly not impossible. Okay, and then so scenarios six, seven, and eight are are fairly similar um, scenarios with just one or the other jumping off. So this one is, to, and I, to be completely honest, my projection is probably closer to scenario eight. If I had to put my chip on one, 
I would probably wager that all three of them fall below the threshold based on the scenarios that they're there, that Tim Settle would fall below, Hollins and Edwards would both fall below, and that we would probably have the net out be the Bills get the fourth and the fifth because they had Dane Jackson and Terrell Dodson cancel out Curtis Samuel and Austin Johnson. I think that's my guess would be the most uh, the most likely to happen. But this goes through each of them where – in scenario six, you have Tim Settle falls off, but so does Mac Collins. That still protects Gabe Davis because Mike Edwards made it onto the equation. Scenario seven is Tim Settle falls off, but Mike Edwards falls off. Mac Collins makes it into the equation, but that still protects Gabe Davis. And then, like I said, scenario eight is all three of the borderline guys fall below. Um, Tim Settle, Mac Collins, and Mike Edwards all fall below the threshold, and that would bring Gabe Davis and Leonard Floyd back into play. And if you look at the overall, it shows that in you know uh, four and half of the scenarios, scenario two, three, four, and five, and eight, and scenario two is the one right now as is if everything stayed exactly the way it is. Um, in half of them, Gabe Davis and Leonard Floyd are in play. Um, you get the fourth and the fifth. fifth. In seven out of the eight, Gabe Davis's fourth round pick is in play. That seems like by far the most likely uh, that they, they at least have that. And then in a handful, you cut it down to just Gabe Davis. In three out of the eight, you only get his fourth round pick. So I think most of the outcomes here, like you said, the seventh round pick is kind of a, a bonus anyways. It's something that I don't think a lot of teams put a ton of value in regardless. Um, they're at least looking at getting a, a strong value back for Gabe Davis. Yeah. Yeah. And when it comes to scenario eight, I think the way that one happens is if, is if the NFL MC just judges the total number of uh, league wide players at the end of the regular season to be very high. And when that happens, it's just going to keep, you know, it, it's going to make it, uh, oh, excuse me. I have that backwards where it's very low because that would, um, up those cutoffs and make it harder to qualify as a compensatory free agent right there. Hmm. So Interesting. it would be a situation that the number is usually around 1900 players, but if it was like more in the 1800s or so that, that would probably be where scenario eight comes into play. Okay. Interesting. So uh, again, th this is a really uh, interesting discussion. Something that uh, a lot of folks have, uh, you know, really come to to follow you and and, and trust your work over at, over the cap and on Twitter. Um, let the folks know what else you have going on. What are the things you're working on over at over the cap and and some of the other things you guys have coming up that they could check out. Yeah, well, you know, things are just going to go, you know, a little bit silent uh, in the NFL around this time. You know, they try to manufacture stuff like the schedule release right now. Um, but, you know, it's it's a good time to just take a step back and uh, look at how the site is doing. You know, there'll probably be some maintenance things that I will take care of during this time. Um, but there's always it's always a good time to just maybe look at some trends, see, you know, take a look at the data and see if there's anything new that pops up and exactly what that is. Um, you know, I can't say at this point, you know, we're always trying to you know, look at the data and try to make some more insights that can be useful for, for people following the NFL. That's awesome. We really appreciate it. Like I said, I, I can't recommend all the things you guys do at it over the cap.com enough. It's my go-to site for everything salary cap and, and financially driven in the NFL. Uh, you, Jason, uh, so many of the others over at the site, uh, Troy have been, you know, great you know people to work with and certainly helped educate me on uh more of what's going on w within that space and and tried to help translate that over to nfl fans and to the bills fans listening here so we certainly appreciate all of your work and everything that you do uh you guys will be able to find uh nick's account and and more of the the resources we talked about in the show description here uh but beyond on behalf of nick corti uh, i am greg thompson you've been listening to the greg thompson sports show and we 